Hi everyone, today I thought I'd give some love to the Staudinger reaction. But given all the talk about click chemistry in recent times because of the Nobel Prize this year, I thought it would be good to go through another trick that organic azides can do, and they're used in a very early example of bioorthogonal chemistry. So an organic azide is the functional group N3, and if we have a look at the Lewis structures, we can get a clue about their chemistry. The Lewis structures are just a little bit clunky using our normal representation, looking something like this, which is one of the resonance structures, but another one can be drawn just by pushing some arrows like this. We have an overall neutral functional group, which is linear around the central nitrogen, but we can use these two extreme resonance structures to predict some reactivity. For example, if I were going to treat this with a general electrophile, E+, I'd expect either the most internal nitrogen to react with it as a nucleophile, or the terminal position, which can be seen on either of the two resonance structures. But also predicted by the resonance structure is the behaviour with a nucleophile, in that we'd predict the two N nitrogens to also be reactive with nucleophiles. So with a general nucleophile minus, I can attack on the left structure like this, on the terminal nitrogen, or on the internal nitrogen like this, on the other structure. So we can react both the terminal nitrogen and the most internal nitrogen with both electrophiles and nucleophiles. The terminal end is much more sterically accessible, so perhaps that can have a big influence on the selectivity. Now for the Staudinger reaction, I'm just going to pick one of the resonance structures, the one which will more clearly map onto the reactivity that's observed, and I'm going to react it with triphenylphosphine. It's of course a decent nucleophile with the phosphorus lone pairs, and because it's quite bulky, it will selectively react as a nucleophile on the end of these azides. This is probably a reversible attack to give me this charge separated intermediate. Now that nitrogen minus is right next to the phosphorus plus, so we can form a ring. Now this ring might be a little bit strained, but also it might not be as bad as you think. Because the phosphorus is pentavalent, we'd expect it to have a trigonal bipyramidal structure, one of the bond angles of which is of course 90 degrees. The phosphorus of course is quite big as well, so the phosphorus nitrogen bond will be longer than if we were considering a ring purely composed of elements in the second period. Nonetheless, this is prone to collapsing, like this, to spit out nitrogen gas. That will leave the reaction flask, because any sensible chemist won't be doing this in a sealed container, and we'll get this aminophosphorane as our product, which can also be drawn in its other resonance form. And that shows us the key intermediate that we form, often referred to as an azer illid. Azer just meaning nitrogen. So what can the azer illid do? Well, in the first instance, you can react it with water. This, of course, could be in the same flask as the triphenylphosphine was. The N- minus can attack the proton source, like this, to give me an NH bond and leave me with an electrophilic phosphorus. But of course, we've just generated OH minus, which can come in an attack. And now we formed an even stronger phosphorus oxygen bond. And as is commonly observed in organic chemistry, it would be great if we could form a phosphorus oxygen double bond because that's way stronger. And we can do so here by this intermediate picking up another proton. So the product of this reaction would just be the amine plus triphenylphosphine oxide. This is a strong enthalpic driving force. So why might we want to do this? Well, essentially our overall transformation is that we take our azide and under very mild reaction conditions of triphenylphosphine oxide in the presence of water, we make an amine directly. And all we have to do is separate the triphenylphosphine oxide. This is compatible with many other functional groups, but one of the most important ones to keep an eye out for in complex molecule synthesis is that perhaps a more standard way of reducing an azide to an amine is to do a hydrogenation reaction and this is all well and good, provided you haven't got other functional groups such as alkenes and alkynes. So these types of Staudinger conditions can be quite orthogonal to lots of other things. Another point I should note is that the azide is easy to install by SN2 reaction, just using sodium azide as a nucleophile. So this is quite an operationally easy way to install a primary amine. But of course, this isn't the azide illid's only trick. Being an illid, we might expect it to react with carbonyls. And of course it can. So just as an example, I'll just react it with a generic aldehyde here, and we can get the normal formation of a ring that we'd see in a Wittig reaction. The ring, of course, can collapse down again like this to form some new double bonds, and here form a CN double bond and form an imine. And of course, the driving force is the same again for forming triphenylphosphine oxide. Now, the control on the geometry of the EZ double bond is probably going to be dependent on exactly what your R group's on, as is per normal in the Wittig reaction. And unsurprisingly, this reaction is just called an azer reaction and can be a pretty neat way of forming carbon-nitrogen bonds without issues of polyalkylation, for example, or competitive reactivity with other functional groups. Once you've got your imine, you can do whatever you want with it. You could reduce to the amine using standard reduction conditions for this, 
So that would be like hydrogen and palladium on carbon to do a hydrogenation, or maybe sodium cyanoborohydride, or just sodium borohydride if the rest of your molecule is tolerant of that. So just as an example, we can show this being used in an intramolecular reaction. Say I had a compound with a ketone and a bromide in it. I could react this with sodium azide to get an SN2 reaction to work. In fact, it might even be a smart idea to put in a catalytic amount of lithium iodide with this reaction. This will act as a Finkelstein catalyst for this reaction, as in a nucleophilic catalyst. This is particularly good for promoting SN2 reactions, because in the first step, I- is a really good SN2 nucleophile will displace the bromide, but the iodide itself is a really good leaving group, which allows our azide to attack. And then all we need to do is add the triphenylphosphine, which will turn the azide into the azo ilid, which can then do an intramolecular reaction, which will be fast with the ketone that's nearby, to quickly form this five-membered ring. And of course, the only byproducts here are triphenylphosphine oxide and nitrogen gas. So a pretty mild set of conditions for forming this imine and a heterocycle from pretty simple to make starting materials. Now, the Staudinger reaction in itself is useful for organic synthesis, but it also has a really important use in chemical biology. In fact, it's arguably one of the earliest reactions that have been noted for being bioorthogonal, because, for example, these trisubstituted phosphines and azides are not commonly found in living systems. And so they can be tolerated when doing chemistry in biological systems without interfering with anything else. So the so-called Staudinger ligation is an example of bioconjugation chemistry using this reaction. And how this works is that we'd start off with, say, an aromatic ring substituted with an ester functional group and also a phosphine ortho to it. So if you like, we've just modified one of the aromatic groups on triphenylphosphine to make something like this. But the key point is you can attach a biological probe of any type you like covalently bound somewhere else on the aromatic ring. I'm just going to represent my chemical probe, which could be something fluorescent, for example, with a little star, and that's going to be attached somewhere else on this ring. And what I want to do is attach the fluorescent probe to a specific biological molecule of interest, which I've been able to pre-functionalize with an azide. So we can have some sort of R group here, which is a very heavy abbreviation for a biomolecule. That could be a protein or something for which we've been able to modify one of the amino acid residues, either in initial synthesis or by late stage modification. So here the azide is going to be able to react with the phosphine to form the azo ilid which we know has a resonance structure like this with the charges separated, which might make the mechanism easier to see. We can use the N- to cyclize onto the nearby ester and kick out the methoxide leaving group. That's a similar nucleophilic reactivity of the azo ilid that we saw earlier. So from this reaction, we generate this positively charged intermediate, which will be electrophilic, of course. We'll also generate the methoxide anion. And if we're in a biological system, it's almost certain that that comes across some water and generates a hydroxide anion, which is an even better nucleophile, which can then react with our phosphine. And then one final step, we can form the strong phosphorus oxygen double bond again and protonate on the nitrogen to give us our new bioconjugate, where we can see our biological molecule R has been attached to our fluorescent probe via covalent linking, which isn't going to break apart anytime soon. That amide in the middle is pretty sturdy. And so this reaction can be quite good for stitching these two molecules together, and all we've got left that's a bit extraneous is this triphenylphosphine oxide, but luckily that's pretty inert in biological systems. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do drop it a like, and I've just put some other videos of mine that might be of interest on the screen now.